one of the um, other sectors that we do some business in is uh, the insurance companies have changed some of the things that they're looking at from a risk perspective. And I thought this was really interesting. With the flattening of the pyramids and the structures in organisations, it has clearly caused more, uh, let's say, pressure on the frontline supervisors. They have many more people and much greater spans of control. And so some of the insurance companies are assessing that as part of their risk assessment when they're putting together their, their um, you know, cost structures. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It might not be news to the, the guys who deal with risk every day, but it was certainly an interesting piece for me. And so on that note, we'll get into the many faces of risk. Kay Mims is going to be um, a chair, chairperson for the panel this afternoon. Kay is the managing director for the Americas, for Proudfoot's mining practice. And uh, with a geology background, she always amazes me, and two little twin girls, they're not so little anymore though, okay? Um, but two, two twin girls, all that time that you were able to get your, your mining boots on and travel the world um, and still be able to come to work and do a, an awesome job every day. So thanks for that. But um, on to risk, I'll hand off to you. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, before we talk about the fun stuff and the future of risk and the many faces of risk, I'd like to introduce our panellists today. Um, on the far end, Michael Hartley. Michael, uh, we need to uh, release in time to speak as part of one of the unearthed uh, accelerator pitches uh, immediately after this. And I'm very pleased to have Michael part of the group because he um, not only has a background in uh, operations and risk and safety in uh, oil and gas extensively, but also enterprise risk management with Barrick for a number of years, and recently uh, co-founded uh, his uh, risk uh, company, uh, Mintel. Mintel. Mintel, excuse yeah. me. Next to Michael is Elizabeth Stein. Elizabeth is a Castlesbrock Fellow uh, at the School of Law at Western University. She's responsible for running a program on mining uh, finance and sustainability and um, is uh, very pleased to have her uh, participating this afternoon and then look out for her, her time on the stage tomorrow. Next to Elizabeth is Gordana Slepchev. Gordana is a mining engineer that uh, uh, works, she's the COO um, of Anaconda Mining. They're a Canadian uh, gold producer junior. They have um, one project in operation and uh, building up uh, the second one. Um, so thank you, glad to have you on the, on the panel. Gordana. Thank you for the invite. And last but not least is Dean Gehring. Dean is EVP and CTO, uh, Newmont Gold Corp. Uh, Dean was telling me the list of the things that that role actually encompasses. It's everything from technical services, mine planning, resource planning, IT, supply chain, operational technology, and a whole um, a gamut of, of other um, uh, important functions with Newmont Gold Corp. Um, so, very happy to have you all on the panel today. Thank you. So, one of the things I'd like to uh, remind you of is early this morning, Pam talked about um, VUCA, which was, um, I think, a perfect uh, place for us to start our, our panel discussion this afternoon uh, because it really illustrates um, about risk. VUCA, as you may recall, was uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. So that sounds like risk. We're going to take it a step further. Uh, in fact, we'll talk about how do we get to VUCA 2.0. So how do we get from the, the leadership response or the organizational response to, to risk management and a future state? So um, just being cute for a moment, VUCA 2.0's uh, vision, um, understanding, uh, collaboration, and um, adaptability. So, so if we use that to frame our, our risk discussion this afternoon, um, what we talked about in our preamble today was 
the extent to which how do we, how do we shape that future journey? What does um, the risk management of the future need to be in order to be able to address um, all of this complexity, uncertainty? Uh, what's the shape of organizations and in fact our industry need to consider whether you're working for a, a major company, a junior company, um, you're, you're looking to support or, or expand uh, the services in the industry. So I'd perhaps like to start with um, Dean, from your perspective, uh, we were framing some of that risk discussion this morning. What, what do you think are, are some of the most important areas to start with? You know, there's a number of ways to look at it. Uh, one, you can look at just the specific elements of risk that we think we need to manage, which I think are probably foremost on a lot of people's mind when you look at things like uh, license to operate, that continues to come up as a, as a, a key thing. Um, but I think there's also a, a broader question to ask, which is around what's the framework in which we manage these risks? I think that's equally as important. And I think a, a challenge for us today in our industry is that sometimes we convince ourselves that if we have a good process in place and we have good administration, we are therefore doing good risk management. And that's not always the case. And I'm sure that's going to come out pretty richly as part of this conversation today. When we talked about that, uh, framing that uh, future uh, risk um, env management environment, Michael, uh, you were talking about you know, what we need to have some guidelines if we're going to go from the present to a future state. Uh, how should we guide that in terms of, uh, of understanding risk severity or, or the particular um, uh, types of risk? Yeah, to, to build on Dean's point, in terms of you know, ad adopting a framework as opposed to implementing, I think the two are slightly different. So ad adopting the framework is going to take a lot of uh, consultation both at the corporate and at the site level, the operational level, to really understand what that future state looks like so you know when you get there. Uh, and, and then you got to keep that focus tight around the, the context of those risks that are material and, and those controls that are critical. And, so you, you, you have those, you understand what those are and, and what management uh, actions you're putting in place, but then also be ready to, to say, well, what are the next five risks that, we're gonna, that are coming down the pipe? We can get that through scenario planning, but we've got to be able to plan for that as well as part of the framework. So are you suggesting that um, organizations uh, then, it's, it sounds like it could be kind of complex, um, it could be a large risk uh, program, um, it sounds like you know, the, from the status quo or where we are today, maybe there's a long way to go, but are you suggesting that this is a large risk uh, or team in the organization or, or uh, how, does that, how does that group work, do you think? Uh, for, for me, uh, any function is accountable for how performance is measured, not for actually carrying out the work. Uh, so take environment. You know, your environmental VP is not accountable for environmental performance. They're, envi they're, they're accountable for how environmental performance is measured. So I see risk in very much the same way. So it would be a, a lighter central team, but building out the capabilities uh, both at the, the function level and at the site level, that's going to take some, some, some heavy lifting. Uh, but in terms of where you end up, uh, there's maybe a slight bump in your, um, in your risk management headcount, but by no means you know, do you want to deploy a, 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 an army to your sites. I just don't see that as being feasible. You've got to build those capabilities internally. So, Gordana, from your perspective for a, in representing smaller organizations in the industry, um, how do you see that, you know, what are the types of capabilities needed um, to achieve a, a new uh, risk approach? Well, I, I think uh, it all goes back to the training of people, right? <clears throat> so as a smaller group, as you mentioned, we have to identify this risk ahead of time. I mean, the mining bi business is more or less just the risk management business, starting from exploration down to first economics uh, and, you know, building feasibility studies, making sure that makes sense, building your license to operate. And then as you go in the operation and production, making sure that you are ready. So you, uh, many of the companies fail as they start building, constructing, going into the production. 
they lose most of the MPVs in these first, let's say, six months because they are not ready to take on new operations. So, and then as you go through operations, there are many less risks, including dilution, hitting your mining targets, uh, hitting your throughput, recoveries, all these uh, elements. So, uh, one company has to address that in the term of the long-term plan. You have to have your long-term plan. And as you go further, you have five years plan, you have your budget plans and what you're gonna do in each of these respected areas to minimize, let's say, dilution. Uh, one of the group's uh, views here is uh, blast movement monitors, uh, monitoring for dilution control and GPS, all these technologies, sensors, uh, automation in the mill to make sure, uh, cameras, sensors, alarms, all these things that we implement and put in place to uh, minimize downtimes and thus minimize the risk because you know every hour that the mill is not working you're losing money. So those are operational risks as well. So keep these uh, your employees, frontline supervisor, workers, you know, uh, trained to look for these uh, issues or the problems and solve them as soon as possible. So it sounds like it's a mix of both the planning um, components at a not only a strategic and, and uh, long-term uh, level, um, but also uh, making sure that we're measuring the right things. I think, um, Michael, you were saying before, making sure that the people are able to um, act in the day-to-day -day as well. Um, it, so it still sounds complicated. How do you make it more simple, do you think? Michael? Yeah, yeah th this notion of oh, we've got something that's complex, therefore we have to make it simple, I, I don't f fundamentally agree with that. Uh, I think the way to combat complexity is through transparency, not through just making things uh, simple because then we uh, kind of, we, we miss kind mm -hmm. of the 90% the, the, the of the iceberg, uh, to use that analogy. Uh, so again, it, it's, it's keeping the focus very tight first, and then as you get comfortable with your, even if it's top three or top five material risks, then you can expand that out as the organization learns how to really adopt that three layer of assurance approach, your front line, which is measuring performance, your subject matter experts, your second line, they're supporting underperformance, and that audit and assurance piece, that third line, which is really validating good performance. So just to pick up on your point about transparency, um, so I think in our earlier discussions, um, Dean, you were talking about um, how do we make uh, information more transparent, um, particularly to our stakeholders and communities. Um, they're going to be absorbing and, and reviewing all kinds of data. Um, we should probably take advantage of, of uh, factual data that we can provide that can be streamed so that it's, there's a chance that it can compete with some of you know, other types of information that they're going to um, pick up on. Uh, would you like to yeah, comment uh, about yeah, that? Yeah, I think there's, there's, there's two parts that I'd like to specifically respond to. Um, one is I believe that we're moving into an era where our performance data, our performance information as it relates to environmental compliance and other things that impact social license to operate will be made publicly available in real time. That's, I just think that's where it's going to go. If you look at a lot of the regulations now, we're already required to report greenhouse gas emissions and other things that we do on an annual basis. Well, we track those things with instrumentation in real time. So we have the ability to report that to the public in real time. It, we just haven't been made to do that. Uh, I personally believe as an industry we should get on the front foot of that and be willing to, to demonstrate that transparency before somebody makes us do that. Um, I, and then I think what that also leads into, which is the second point I wanted to, to talk about in regards to your question, is how, how do we use that information to keep our, our stakeholders informed? Uh, I think we've seen time and time again that in the absence of information, our stakeholders will typically invent a story that's often worse than the reality. And if we don't feed real information that people can use, you know, our good days and sometimes we might have a bad day. Um, then they're going to fill that void with other information, maybe from people that don't support our industry as much as we do. So Elizabeth, I'd like to pick up on um, something that, that Dean was talking about there. And um, 
it, you know, instead of looking at, at risk and, and uh, information or bad stories, how do we turn those into opportunities? How do we engage with uh, a much broader cohort than, um, than might be inside the gate with us? Uh, how do we uh, invite uh, people like your students and um, people into the industry to, to look at these types of, of maybe data flows or regulatory systems to, to um, have them look at the opportunities to solve that and address it in a different way. Thank you, Kay. Um, I think to tie together a couple of things that have been mentioned thus far, the importance of transparency, uh, the importance of not making things too complex at the same time. Let me just maybe for a moment step back here. So, I'm not a mining person per se, I'm a mining lawyer. Uh, my students are not mining people per se, they thought they were just regular students, now many of them are considering careers as mining lawyers. Um, I say that with a twinkle in my eye because when I first met most of them a year ago, it was a course on natural resource and energy law. And when I got to the mining part of natural resource law rather early in the term, they were like, ooh, mining law. Just to say that they had no idea, right? They had no idea what mining entails. They thought of it as this big bad conglomerate. And this has to do with transparency and with things being more complex. So my, my short answer is, by involving people, by making them feel part, um, by reporting before you are forced to report on various things, by making technologies in such a way that people can understand what is being reported. And another thing that was mentioned this morning, the importance of trust. Really, the, the critical importance of trust. Because I think with the younger generation at the moment, you can't just spin the information, they're not going to fall for it. They have to buy into the viability and they have to buy into the necessity of the industry. And once they see it's a viable and an important industry and it can be responsible and sustainable, then they come to the party. Can I add something to that quickly? Of uh, course. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, risk management systems, the output is we're brilliant until we're catastrophic. Right, and, and that is something that is not going to wash. Uh, so being able to demonstrate that you have the systems in place to be able to detect when these problems take place and that you've been mm -hmm. able to step in and come up with a solution, that's a really good story. Right? Yes. And, and that's something that frankly humanizes uh, mm -hmm. risk management systems to perhaps use the most boring term uh, of the conference thus far. Uh, but that, that engagement uh, you, you have that as a, as a hook to engage with your, with your stakeholders to build that trust. Thanks, Michael. I think uh, you've both touched on something that uh, I really wanted to, to come up today, which was um, in the first instance, we've got the opportunity to create, um, take from the, the current uh, perceptions and uh, views about uh, mining industry, um, uh, whether it be risk um, or the surprises that have happened. Uh, I know I uh, was reading that up to 50%, uh, there was a, a NC State Pool School of Business there, they have their 10th annual um, state of risk oversight and they were talking about over 50% of businesses in that survey, five, four to 500 companies, um, they'll only plan uh, around risk once a year and it, um, we talked about this earlier, it's, it, too frequently it's a bunch of footnotes in the back of a, a, a major report or presentation. Um, having said that, though 75% of those companies surveyed, they experienced some kind of operational surprise uh, that they were not expecting, something happened. So it suggests that we've got um, not only uncertainty and surprises happening, but we've got definitely opportunities to uh, create transparency and to engage lots of different stakeholders. 
it sounds to me like there's an opportunity to create a really different type of ecosystem here, uh, embracing um, what our students and um, many other industry observers, stakeholders and participants can uh, contribute. So, so one, one thing I'd like just to, to add to that is I think part of creating that new future state or that new ecosystem is also to acknowledge where we are today in our maturity mm -hmm. in, 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 in enterprise risk and some of the large risk areas. Um, I, you know, we were talking earlier about this that I, from my perspective, I see that our maturity to enterprise level risk management is similar to where our maturity was around safety management probably 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. where we had safety departments and safety departments were responsible for helping people to be safe. And now if you go to you know, mine sites around the world, you'll find supervisors recognize it's part of their job. Safety departments are much smaller, they're specialists. Uh, today I still see you know, departments that work on enterprise level risk and they call a meeting and they get the subject matter experts together you know, maybe quarterly and then that, to your point, makes its way into a business planning presentation annually it says these are the risks we've considered. And I, I just think that we've got a long way to go, in particular if we look at how safety has matured, I think there's a similar maturity curve for risk management. Mm. So in terms of how do we, how do we make the first steps, um, what are the types of, of skills and capabilities that, that our organizations or, or individuals need? How do we tell somebody who's a, a younger person in the industry or, or someone in the audience who's going, well, uh, you know, I'm involved in understanding and managing risk at a certain level all the time, but how do we grow this um, capability in our people? Um, Elizabeth, is that something you'd like to comment on? I, I like this term that Michael used, humanizing it. Because I think if we humanize it, if we make it not a speciality that only one department does, then it becomes something that every one of us can do. And then it becomes a tangible that the general guy in the room can also aspire to making part of his or her day-to-day -day projects and um, purpose. So therein for me would really lie the solution. Um, Michael, so I, I know your new business is about real-time uh, risk data flows and so on. How do you see people using uh, you know, much more transparent and, and real-time information in terms of risk management? Well, there, there's two ways, uh, is, is providing data and also receiving information. Uh, the, and the data that we ask of our, of, of our people, pardon me, a, need to be complemented with machine and equipment data, first and foremost. Uh, but we have to make sure that our system set up that those data are valid, they're reliable, and we can measure the quality of those inputs, one. And then on the analysis side, that our system is able to collect, not just capture, because we have many ways to, to, to uh, create data, but, but capture, sorry, collect and analyze and then communicate those back to those people who need to be supported in their day-to-day -day decisions. So it's really a, a two-way street. I mean, how many of us have had to fill something out that has just gone into a black hole right, where you don't see what the output is? Well, are you going to do that again? Or are you just going to treat it as a, a bit of a flippant, um, uh, flippant exercise? So that would be, for me, it's not just what they provide, but how they get that back. They've got to see that connection. So the connection between, um, it's, it's a management issue, not so much just a risk management issue, but how do we manage organizations? Uh, so there's the information and then taking action with that information. Um, so Gordana, in, in your business then, um, in terms of the future of, of risk, where, where do you see um, some of the key challenges for for other junior miners are, and, and what do you think are the, going to be the next achievements? Well, uh, we heard uh, a lot of talks uh, a little bit about the uh, social license to operate, and really, uh, as the junior miners start, let's say, exploring, they don't really think about, you know, 
permitting or necessarily developing the project. Only thing they think about is well, let's find that deposit, so let's get there, and then we actually gonna get that to some of the majors and sell. It. So at that point, it's kind of a little bit late. <clears throat> you have to understand. Uh, what are the risks of the project? Where is it? Is it Salmon River nearby? Is it, uh, you know, very close to protected areas? Is there a park? Uh, you know, do you have any uh, rare plants or birds? Is that, uh, you know, close to the marine environment? All these kind of things that are really important uh, that actually don't get addressed early in, in, uh, in the project life. So. You know, a little bit uh, of that understanding is um, as the project's plan, depending on, of course, who's doing exploration and doing that, is just to be aware that uh, actually you have to understand your project and you have to talk with all the stakeholders with the community really, really early on. So uh, as some of the uh, panelists mentioned and people before, it's really, really important to build that trust and really get that license to operate and keep it up. You know, uh, you know, local people sometimes, they, they may not see that as a good thing. We've seen it like all across the globe, people don't want the mining, why? Because they're scared, you know, they, they're scared that all these groups gonna come here, they're gonna take the good stuff, you know, they're gonna ruin their environment, now we're gonna have the big tailings down that are gonna fail, they're gonna be cyanide, the water's gonna be polluted, all that kind of stuff. So it's up to the, the industry, Really to promote that and uh, you know to talk to the companies to, to be there to talk with local residents to talk with First Nations to build the uh, memorandums of understandings uh, you know build the uh, relationships with communities so uh, that process is a little bit more described in Canada where you have to actually as a part of the project development also for the junior miners as well and go and build these relationships uh, outside in the community. So people actually know what are your plans, what you're looking to do there, and you know, break some of these myths. Because you know, cyanide is, God forbid, like you don't want that, like people are really scared. So you have to educate people and community because in the lack of education, people gonna make up things. We, we heard that, we know that's what happened. Like, if you tell stories even to the kids, they're gonna make up the rest of it if you don't tell them everything. So it's better to say what the truth is, you know, uh, create uh, opportunities, you know, hold open houses, uh, have a web page uh, and a Facebook page where you put your blast notification, your water quality data, you put everything that's related to the company, you know, barbecues, community events, that kind of stuff, so people have opportunity to come, come for the site visit, you know, so they can see what's done and how it's done. You know, outside the groups mostly don't know what all is required to run one project and how stringent these laws are and regulations, you know. Uh, usually the water that's been discharged from any mine is way cleaner than, than the receiving water, so we've seen it, we know that for sure. So there are many things that we are obliged to do, but we usually don't uh, really publicize that. We have as the mining community and mining companies do a better job at that. Uh, the only good thing I've seen, uh, and you know, our purpose is good, uh, is uh, you know, seen as some of the commercials on Canadian TV about the pipelines, how pipelines are good for the economy, and uh, I think it's, uh, bigger picture that we have to do here is educate the public about what is the value of the mining and how mining is actually regulated that this is not your grandfather's mine when things were done like you know ad hoc and things are left that uh, you know environment destroyed not cleaned up uh, everybody knows that even before you start any mining you have to submit your reclamation plans, you have to pay in reclamation liability in case that something happens. The money is there to clean up and close the site. And usually it's very hard to close the site. It takes years and years of the monitoring to ensure that site is in good condition so it could be returned to you know, either previous owners, the Crown, in, in case of Canada. 
So it sounds like that, um, well, and I know from speaking with all of you and, and my experience in the industry that there is a lot of really genuine and, and um, hardworking people that, that in the industry that try to accomplish these things. Uh, it also suggests that amongst our own industry uh, participants, whether it be at the association level or uh, membership organizations, um, our uh, suppliers, partners, um, et cetera, can all be part of, of improving um, the story. Is that something that, uh, Elizabeth, that um, you see the, the students and um, the people as they look at the industry, they, they start to peel it back and, and recognize that there's um, you know, things that they didn't, either didn't yet understand or, or would help to, to promote or explain? Well, I think the students, if you want to talk about them specifically, they're kind of a microcosmos for the, the bigger world out mm -hmm. there. So it's interesting to track what happens with them. But certainly also if you look at stakeholders more broadly speaking, for me the mining industry <coughs> used to be quite isolated, um, speaking as an outside observer. Um, and it's important that there should be more integration. The contact that Gordana has been speaking about is vital so that we realize that we are all people, that we are all working towards the same goals at the, same, at the, at the end of the day, um, so that there is this humanizing, fact, humanizing factor. But also, once you demystify the big evil that everybody has been talking, has been telling stories about, by introducing some level of familiarity. Once people start having insight into what happens in the chemical processes, what happens, what type of um, precautions the mines are taking, what type of money they're investing in their research, um, what type of risk management modules they are taking. It doesn't matter really what it is. As soon as people start seeing that it's not just about chasing money, and that it's not just at the cost of everything, and that minds are not against the environment as such. Because it's very easy to make reductive statements about somebody that you don't know and that you don't care about. Once there has been some human contact, it becomes harder to do that. It's a absolute general principle. So I think the more integration there is, the easier it becomes, whether students or other stakeholders or society at large. Hmm. Michael, is there something you'd like to add in terms of how do we um, improve the, the transparency or, or embrace outsiders in? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw the open letter to CEOs that uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock uh, sent mm -hmm. out. Well, the, the underlying message was that you have to be able to demonstrate your purpose. And your yes. purpose is just going beyond uh, you know, financial gains. And you know, Larry Fink cited a couple, of, uh, a, a couple of stats that with the millennial workforce coming in, 63% uh, of them see a, a company's purpose as doing good as opposed to making money, priority one versus priority two. And that not only are these people going to be, the, the millennial generation going to be working for us, they're going to be investing in us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to experience in the next five to seven years the greatest transfer of wealth we've ever seen. He cites $24 trillion to this group who are going to be making investment decisions. Uh, and, and so not having those data and information that can engage with that group uh, in particular, well, then we only have ourselves to blame. We, we see this coming down the path. Yeah. We need money flowing into this industry for a variety of reasons, which we all know. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, you know, capital is, is fleeing the industry because I don't think we've done uh, as well as we could have in terms of making our you know, material risk information as, as transparent as we can to, again, going to, to humanize how we, how we operate. Can I 
just quickly return to the theme of my students. As you can tell, I love my students passionately. <laughs> but really, this microcosmos and this little experiment that we've had. So we went from a point where they were kind of mining that's the absolute evil to that was in fall last year, so September, October last year. By the time we were in January of this year, there was a course called the Mining Finance Speaker Series where I have abused multiple of my good friends here, such as Kay, such as John Wiley, such as Gordona, who have been wonderful industry contributors to this series, who have brought the face of mining to these students. Long story short, we are now at the point where these students are actively playing the gold market. No, oh, great. So they are starting to invest. And I know this because they tell me in class, I have them for a different course at the moment, they tell me in class what the gold price is and they tell me which companies are really doing very well at the moment and which ones you should not buy stock of. <laughs> Dean's dying to know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in terms of um, bringing this to, to some kind of, uh, you know, what, is the, what does the future look like? We've talked about uh, evolution, we've come, uh, we, we all understand a lot about the state of play. We have an idea about what the future would look like. Um, uh, what do you see as, as the main challenges uh, in, in making the next steps, Dean? So, you know, I think what's interesting is to step back and look at the conversation we've been having up to this point where we've been talking about you know, a key risk, which is licensed to operate. A lot of the things we've been talking about relate to how do we engage with people that make those sort of licensed to operate decisions. And it's interesting in that all of those things we've mentioned are things that are really working and really making a difference, whether it's engaging with students or engaging with First Nations, those are things that work. But sometimes when we put together our, our material risk plans, and the mitigation steps, we don't put that same level of realism in action. You know, I'll see things like we need to monitor this or, or we're doing something that doesn't really change. And I think the challenge for us as an industry is making sure that our risk management plans actually have things in them that are gonna make a difference. And it's not just doing an exercise to say, we've identified the risk. So now that if that happens, I can go to the board and say, no, we already identified this but it's actually doing something to actively manage it. I believe you can, but I think it's also it's a challenging thing to do, and you have to get the right people in the room, and I think you also have to recognize we haven't always been good at that in the past. Yeah, so I think that I <coughs> would agree that the, um, it's about making sure that there's not just a small group, um, that we know how to engage larger groups, uh, different voices and new voices, uh, in that process, because um, I think we're we're still coming from a um, a, a good Australian uh, explanation about uh, you know how we think about risk is risk the risk management is really just a handbrake on happiness. So how do we take um, from that perspective of saying no we can't do that because to how do we do that because we know it's okay um, to to take a certain decision. Um, so, Michael, in terms of, of uh, the way you've seen other companies operate, um, how do you see uh, what they've done that's, that's maybe uh, fresh or, or different in this respect? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I, I just want to say that to, to build on Dean's point, I'll, I'll touch on that in a second because mm -hmm. there's one something I wanted to add. Uh, the, there's two, cha two big challenges that we can uh, over audit things. We can send out reams of quote unquote inspectors. Uh, and that's really just demonstrating our capacity to administer versus our capability to manage the risk. Mm -hmm. right? and, and so in your risk registers, that column about controls, well, we, have, we put those in place to mitigate unwanted risk exposure. So to, go, to build on to Dean's point, is that those things we can uh, essentially quantify in terms of the value that they bring to our organization, those particular controls. And if we take a look at, at controls through that prism, we'll get a long way down the road. And, and that's where I'd like to just go back to what I said earlier about that um, relationship to safety maturity. 
30 years ago in this industry, we'd put controls in place that looked like we're going to train, retrain the operators. And that, that was the control. And we recognized that wasn't really a control. And to Michael's point, it's that same thing. It's, it's getting down to the, the essence of what is the control. It, can you do it? Is it going to make a difference? And then making sure it gets done. Mm -hmm. It gets back to the cultural change. You know, as, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, with safety and with risk, we have to change the way we think. That's, that's the solution, basically. Thank you. I'd actually like to invite um, anyone from the audience to ask any questions they might have of, of uh, the panelists. Is there something that we didn't touch on yet today? Um, or, uh, yes, I can see a question. Don't forget to mention who you are and where you're from. Oh, OK. I'm going to be transparent. I'm John Kastner with Isometrics. Um, so you talked about transparency. I think we've heard that throughout the day today. And I think this is rare that we have a lawyer on a panel. So in my experience, there's the transparency side of things, which is fantastic. And then the legal team steps in and says, no, 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 no. You can only say X, Y, and Z. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear from the collective panel how you intend to manage transparency with legal risk. Take her. Sure. <laughs> so uh, just, just quickly, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not deflect, but it's going to look like that. Um, I, what, one of the things you're highlighting is, is that we actually have some internal conflicts in all of our organization around risk management. And, and let me give you just an example. Um, you can make it, uh, an impassioned argument that says, if we're really concerned about a certain risk, like a supplier risk, we need to really understand the entire supply chain, clear back to the inputs that go into what the manufacturer gets before they send it to us. And maybe that's the right thing to do. From, you can convince yourself from a moral standpoint, and from a risk management standpoint, that's the right thing to do. But then at some point, you'll get somebody, maybe from the legal team, that says, well, wait a minute, be careful, because the more you start to direct that work, the more liability we take on for what they're doing. And so we want to, we want to keep a firewall between us so we don't accept any more liability. And I'm not saying that that's an excuse to not have these debates and conversations, but it, it's just the real world is that you will have some, some um, conflicting priorities, and everybody's trying to do the right thing. <laughs> can, can I please take this question? <laughs> um, I must stand up for the lawyers for, the, for a moment here, and please note that I'm not a practicing lawyer for this very reason, but <laughs> there is a good reason why the lawyers do what they do, because it's the function of a lawyer to avoid liability. So lawyers are by nature prudent beings. Um, <laughs> but that said, you, you can't spend your whole life so scared that you never do anything. I know that doesn't solve your problem with lawyers and legal risk, but I'm not sure that that is one that we can solve in half an hour or five minutes or however much time we have at this stage. So regardless, transparency is important and you have to get people's buy-in. If the lawyers say it's not possible, then maybe you also need to look at the quality of the lawyers out there. And uh, no, nothing against your lawyers. In my experience, you get two kinds of lawyers. You get deal makers and deal breakers. Both kinds exist. That's all I say. Just one last point, though, to that. One of the things, the way you asked that question made it sound like we were going to do something and then the lawyer said. And I think part of this process has to be the people that have an influence over this need to be a part of the conversation from the beginning. Yes. It can't be people brought in towards the end when they haven't had an opportunity to, to frame it in the beginning. Absolutely. I think it depends also on, on the company. Some companies disclose more things and some less. You know. uh, whatever the company thinks it's fully material, they feel obligation to disclose to the shareholders and stakeholders. Thank you. I think we are out of time. But um, one of the things that I take away from this conversation is one foot in the present, one foot in the future all the time. It just seems to be a guiding principle for a lot of the different aspects of mining that we're looking at today. Brilliant discussion.
Fantastic. Thank you.